Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Now, in the previous lecture, we introduced various versions of L'Hopital's rule and stated and proved all of them. And what we particularly saw is that they really come as a consequence of a generalized mean value theorem that's due to Cauchy. Now, we've talked a lot about the mean value theorem. We've got a lot of mileage out of it, right? We've seen that it's a generalization of Rolle's theorem and that it's used to, uh, to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, if you think about all of the names that I just dropped there, I've talked about Rolle's theorem and means, mean value theorem, uh, L'Hopital's rule, the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? I've covered most of the main theorems from introductory calculus. But of course, there's one major one missing. And that's going to be the one that we're going to focus on today. That is Taylor's theorem. Now, let's just think about what Taylor's theorem loosely says. So if you have seen it before, this will make sense. If not, you'll see what I mean as we go through the lecture. But what Taylor's theorem says is that you can approximate a continuous and differentiable function via a polynomial. Now, some people typically think that uh, Taylor's theorem really says that that's what you can do. You can do this approximation. But no, what Taylor's theorem actually says is if you did that approximation, how bad of a uh, approximation is it? That is, Taylor's theorem quantifies the error between your original function and the polynomial expansion. So I want you to keep this in mind because I think a lot of people get confused when they think about what Taylor's theorem says. People confuse a Taylor expansion, that is the Taylor polynomial, and Taylor's theorem, which quantifies the error between the original function and its expansion. Okay, let me actually write down what it is that I'm trying to say here, and let's jump right into the lecture. Let me start with a, a bit of nomenclature here. So I'm going to write this as a definition, but it's going to be a little bit more focused on what we'll talk about today. It's not going to be the most general version of this. But let's say, uh, let's denote the space CN and then A minus R, A plus R. So this is just like our usual continuous function interval. This is a interval centered around a value A. It goes distance r to the left, distance r to the right. The only new addition here is that I have this n up top. And this is going to be the set of all functions f such that at least the first n derivatives so the first n derivatives uh, of f are continuous. So that's what that exponent on the space means. It means that all of the derivatives are going to be continuous as well. So every time you take a derivative, it's still in C uh, of or this space of continuous functions. And so really what this means is that thus, you know, the kth derivative is in the space of continuous functions on this interval for all, uh, let's say, 0 less than or equal to k, which is less than or equal to n. And the 0 here is just meant to be the original function. The 1 represents the first derivative, 2, third derivative, and then this k term up here is the kth derivative. OK, now let's imagine we have a function from this space. And remember, uh, what Taylor's theorem is trying to do is trying to approximate by polynomials. So let's imagine we have an n degree polynomial. So we want to do something like this. So we want to say, I have a function, and I want to approximate it by a polynomial where I have a constant term c0. I have a linear term c1. I have maybe a quadratic term c2 and so on and so forth. And this is going to be n, uh, this is going to be in Cn. So it has n derivatives. So that's going to be the power that I'm going to go up to in my polynomial expansion. This will make a little more sense in a few moments. But what I want you to draw your attention to immediately is that all of my polynomial terms are actually centered around the center of my interval, right? So remember, f belongs to this 
interval that is centered around A. So what I'm doing with my polynomial here is centering it around the center of my interval. R just tells me I've got wiggle room to move on either side. And in fact, if this thing was actually going to be equal, so let's get rid of this for a moment. And let's imagine this is actually equal, okay? So this is just imagination for now, but we could ask ourselves, you know, what would the coefficients be? These C0, C1, C2, right? Because we haven't chosen them yet. Well, I can put X equal to A into this, let's say. And this tells me that F of A is just equal to C0. Why? Because every other term is centered around A. And so that means that all of the X minus A terms are going to disappear. Okay, well then I can do the same thing with the derivative, right? So I can take F prime of A. And in this case, I'm going to, the C0 term is going to disappear because it's constant. I'm going to be left with C1 plus 2C2, X minus A, and so on and so forth. And I've got all of these terms that have X minus A in them that are going to disappear when I put X equal to A in here. And so I get that the first derivative at A is also equal to C1. Okay. Now, if you tried to take a guess without, if you haven't seen Taylor series before, you would probably guess that this is going to be uh, just C2, right? That's sort of what the pattern is spelling out. But you have to be careful because there's this exponent up here and we know that when we differentiate, it comes down out front. So actually, if you take two derivatives, this is going to be 2C2. And if you look at the third derivative here, you're actually going to get 3 coming from the third exponent. Then that exponent turns into 2. And that's going to come down as well. And then the next one is 1, which we're not going to put in. And so C3, which is the same as 3 factorial times C3. And in general, this would give us that my, say, nth derivative at A is going to be n factorial and then times Cn, right? So this would be uh, going all the way up. Okay. So then this means that I can write my coefficients. I can rearrange for this. And this is going to be the kth derivative at A divided by k factorial. Right, so I'm isolating for each one of the coefficients after doing all of that work. And this is for all k equal to 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n. Well, this leads to our first definition, right? This polynomial is what we call the Taylor polynomial. Like I said, I think sometimes people confuse Taylor's theorem with a Taylor polynomial. So I don't want you to confuse these two things. So let's start with the polynomial here. So we define the, let's put this in red, the nth Taylor polynomial, the nth Taylor polynomial, and this is going to be P for polynomial, N for the degree. This is going to be that sum that I wrote up above, and I'm going to write this in complete generality. So I'm going to use the large sum notation. This is the kth derivative at a divided by k factorial, and then x minus a to the power of k. So if you just write out that sum, it's going to be the same thing that you saw uh, right up here. The only difference is now that I've defined what c0, c1, c2, et cetera, all are. And of course, this works for all f in my space cn. Right, so my n times differentiable functions. And it should be immediately obvious to you why I need all n derivatives here, right? Because if you look at that expansion, well, I'm taking at least n derivatives. So I need to be able to know that these derivatives exist and we need continuity of these things. Okay, so like I said, Taylor's theorem Taylor's real result is an approximation result. So what we could do is we could say, well, I know that f of x certainly doesn't necessarily equal to this, right? That might, that might not be the case because f might not be a polynomial. 
but we want to know if sort of this is true, if this is an approximation. And so really what we want to ask ourselves is sort of how big is this thing? The difference of my function from this polynomial. That's the question that we want to ask ourselves. And so the first thing that you might ask yourself is, you know, why would we want to do this? Well, if you do anything on a computer, uh, what we can do is we can quantify deviation from, say, what could be a very complicated function, say, sine or cosine or e to the x. And as long as these two things are close, so the original function and its Taylor polynomial, that means that we can just work with a polynomial. And polynomials are great, right? We spend most of high school learning about polynomials and working with them and, and even, you know, into, uh, into college. So we're probably pretty good with polynomials. And so this is one of the advantages that Taylor's polyno or that Taylor polynomials give us is that, you know, as long as we can actually do this approximation, now we're working in familiar territory. Now we're working with polynomials and life is good. So the question is, you know, how do we actually quantify how big this is and, and how can we guarantee that these things are actually good approximations? Well, this leads to Taylor's theorem. So let's take a look at this. Taylor's theorem. Okay, so let's say if f the, uh, the n plus first derivative of a function f exists uh, for all x in the interval, and we're going to use that same interval we've been using over and over, so centered at a with a little wiggle room, then we write, okay, then we write, or sorry, then we have I should uh, be very, very precise here. It's not writing. It's the, you know, we have this exact relationship. Pn of x plus, and now we write Rn of x. This means remainder. So we can write the original function as the Taylor polynomial plus a little leftover. Now, if you rearrange that, that remainder is the error that I just said we're interested in. Rn of x is equal to Okay, so this is the n plus first derivative at some point mu divided by n plus one factorial and then x minus a to the n plus one. And this is for some suitable value of mu. Uh, and this is going to be between a and x. Okay, so what this says is that if you want to approximate a function at some value x that is in a neighborhood, it is close to a, and that's what my a minus r and a plus r uh, interval is saying. Well, this says that you can write it as the, the Taylor polynomial up to some uh, degree n plus a little remainder term. And what is exactly the remainder term? Well, it looks a lot like the original terms from the Taylor polynomial. The only difference now is that I don't have the nth derivative at a, I have it at some point mu. And I've got this polynomial coefficient on here as well. Now, what I really want you to draw some attention to here is that if x is very, very close to a, then this thing can be made small. And so that means that the remainder is small. And so that means that this approximation right here that I have is very, very good when X is close to A. That's what Taylor's theorem is really telling you. It says, you know, if you, if you restrict yourself to being very, very close to A, then you can guarantee that this thing really looks like a polynomial. So the way I think of Taylor's theorem is it's a zoom in problem, right? It says if you zoom in super, 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 super close to the point x equal to a on the function f of x, then the function is just going to look like a polynomial, right? It might be some crazy, crazy complicated function when you look at it, you know, maybe you plot it in Desmos or something like that. But if you super, super zoom in on a point, it, the more you zoom in, the more it'll look like a polynomial. 
That's what Taylor's theorem is really telling us. Now, I want to uh, draw another uh, our attention to another piece of this, and that's the mu. Where have we seen mu before like this? Well, we've seen it come up in the mean value theorem. And I think when we talked about the mean value theorem, I emphasized that this is just a very basic version of the of Taylor's theorem. In fact, Taylor's theorem is just a general mean value theorem. So let's put this as a little remark here. In the case where n is equal to zero, we get the mean value theorem, the original mean value theorem. Why? Because in this case, p0 of x is just equal to a single point f of a. And the remainder from above is going to be f prime of a times x minus a. Sorry, f prime of mu, pardon me. And so if we put this all together, this gives us f of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of mu x minus a, which we can just rearrange this and see that this is just the mean value theorem, right? So we get uh, f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a, and that's equal to f prime of mu. So Again, you should really think about Taylor's theorem as being a sort of generalized mean value theorem. And the only reason I say that is because sometimes it's easier for, for us to understand the mean value theorem because we work with it a little bit more. And so then, you know, extending this up to Taylor's theorem, we can use, we can leverage that understanding, that intuition that we built up in the mean value theorem, carry it over. Okay, let's take a look at the proof here. The proof of this is pretty fun. So let's fix a value of x, okay? Now, if x is equal to a, then we easily see, so we see that f of x is equal to pn, uh, sorry, f of a, pardon me, because x is equal to a, is equal to pn of a, so that rn of a is equal to zero. And the reason for this is because pn of a is just equal to f of a, right? So there is no remainder that needs to be considered here anymore. So clearly we want to consider the case where x is not equal to a. So on the other hand, if x does not equal to a, then, well, first of all, this thing is not equal to zero. This clearly does not equal to zero. So nothing fancy here, but x minus a isn't equal to zero. So raising it to a power, dividing it by a factorial, that's all good. So that tells us that there exists some k in R such that, so again, remember x is fixed here. The remainder in terms of x, which by definition is f of x minus the Taylor polynomial. Well, we could, we could write this since, let's put this in green, since this thing does not equal to zero, x is fixed. This right here now is just a real number. So I can just multiply or divide by uh, k in, either, in order to make these things equal. So, for example, imagine Rn of x is equal to three, and I know that my green star up here is equal to two, then my k would just be three over two, right? It's just whatever I need to multiply in here to make this thing equal. But what this says now is that I need to show that k is the n plus first derivative at some value of mu, right? That's what essentially we boiled down proving uh, Taylor's theorem to be. So the question is, how do we do this? Well, it's pretty cool, actually. We do this as a little trick. Remember, x is fixed. So what we're going to do is define a new function. We'll call this h of alpha. Alpha is my new variable. This is f of x, x is fixed. That's just a single value, doesn't matter what it is. And then minus, okay, let's look at this. It's going to be the Taylor polynomial. So 
k equals zero to n, the kth derivative at alpha. So I'm letting my a value vary a little bit here. Divided by k factorial, x minus alpha to the k, and then plus k over n plus one factorial, x minus alpha to the n plus one. Okay, so what is it that I did here? I, I basically defined a function of a, right? I called it alpha because I didn't want it to look confusing. Uh, but essentially, I'm sort of varying where the center of this uh, thing is going to be. And I want you to note something immediately, right? A lot of the proofs that we've been doing lately look very, very similar. And that makes sense, right? Because they're all just sort of the mean value theorem over and over and over, right? Uh, Cauchy's generalized mean value theorem did something similar. The fundamental theorem of calculus did something similar. Even the proof of the mean value theorem does something very similar. It just uses Rolle's theorem. So, you know, we have all of these very, very abstract results that sort of, you know, when you interrogate them in, in terms of looking at the proof, they sort of collapse into being very, very similar. So let's take a look at this. So if we set alpha is equal to A, uh, we get, well, what happens here? Well, we see that H of A is equal to F of X minus, now what happens on the inside? We get the original Taylor polynomial, and then plus this thing, n plus one factorial, x minus a. So this remainder term. But remember, by the choice of k, we said that this is equal to f of x. So we found a root of the function h. So this is, by definition, of k. OK, now we're going to do another fun one. If we set alpha equal to x, which remember x was fixed, then in this case we get, well, we get h of x and we get f of x. And what happens if we put x into everything up here? Well, all of these x minus alpha to the k's, they disappear. And that just leaves us with the constant term inside of our Taylor polynomial. So I get f of x, the quote unquote constant term. And then I get a bunch of zeros. And so clearly this thing is equal to zero as well. So finally, so also h is differentiable with respect to alpha, right? That's just because it's a polynomial. Uh, well, it becomes from the fact, yes, exactly. It's a polynomial, right? Because this term right here is not being differentiated, although it, that's fine, it's still differentiable, but we're essentially just differentiating all of these terms, right? These polynomials. The polynomials are always differentiable to every single order. So by Rolle's theorem, There exists mu between a and x such that h prime of mu is equal to zero, right? So it's always the same thing. It's sort of always coming back to Rolle's theorem. So then what happens here? Well, I bet you this is going to give us the value of mu that we want. Let's see how it this happens, though. If we take... Um, h prime of alpha here, so I take just the derivative of this function, this becomes, well, first of all, zero. That comes from what I was showing above. This f of x doesn't depend on alpha. OK, that's all right. And then minus, now we've got some really big, complicated terms to take derivatives of. The first is the constant term. Uh, this becomes f prime of alpha. So you just differentiate that thing. Let's put brackets around it so we know this comes from the k equal to zero term. Now, here's the trick. When you are differentiating all of the other terms by alpha, there are two pieces that need to be differentiated. That means you have a product rule coming in here. So, for example, if you do the first derivative term, differentiating the x minus alpha term gives you a negative. 
and then you've got f prime of alpha coming from the, uh, the coefficient in the Taylor uh, polynomial. Similarly, if you differentiate the coefficient in the Taylor polynomial, you get the second derivative of alpha, and then you still have this linear term, right? So you see that it's complicated. Now, if you go up to the second order term, you get basically the same thing. You get f double prime of alpha times x minus alpha. That's after differentiating x minus alpha squared and then knocking off the uh, two in the quotient of this uh, term. And then I've got a third derivative of alpha divided by two factorial, and that's times x minus alpha squared. Okay, let me do one more term here. Sorry, let's go all the way up. So we sort of repeat this pattern over and over and over. And then the last term in the Taylor polynomial is going to be the nth derivative at alpha divided by n minus one factorial, and then times x minus alpha to the n minus one. And then the other term that you're differentiating, if that's part of that, you get the n plus first derivative at alpha divided by n factorial x minus alpha to the n. Okay, that takes care of differentiating all of the Taylor uh, polynomial terms, the pn terms. <clears throat> and let's do the remainder while we have it, and I'll show you what happens. So this becomes k over n factorial and then x minus alpha to the n. And note the minus sign in front of this, that's coming from applying the chain rule finally. And we've got all this. Okay, so what's exciting about this? Well, I've got f prime of alpha and I've got minus f prime of alpha. So that means that the order zero term cancels with one of the order one terms. But then I've got f double prime x minus alpha, one of the order one terms, and I've got the negative of it. It cancels with the next term up. And similarly, this is going to cancel and it's going to cancel all the way up. And so, all that I've got left are two terms, the very last term of the Taylor expansion right here, and the remainder term. So if h prime of mu is equal to zero, that tells me that these two terms have to be equal to each other. This implies that, so you can see I've got n factorials lining up, I've got x minus alpha to the n's, well, then the only piece left is that this thing is equal to K, which proves the theorem. So it looks a little complicated. It's a little hairy, right? Because it's kind of weird. We're used to taking derivatives in X and here we have derivatives in alpha. But if you can get past that, it's really just the same process over and over, right? It's the application of rules there, right? You find two points that are equal. You say the derivative's zero somewhere in between there. And then, you know, boom, everything sort of follows by calculating out where the derivative is going to be zero. It's always the same process over and over. Okay, let me show you an example of how this works, okay? So, as I said, the great utility of Taylor's theorem is that it allows you to uh, sort of approximate really, really complicated functions by functions that are simple, polynomial functions, right? I love polynomial functions. I can work with polynomials all day. So let's say, let f of x equal to e to the x. And let's write, well, let's write f of x is equal to the Taylor polynomial of degree n plus the remainder term here. Uh, and we're gonna write this in powers of x, which is x minus zero, which means that we're gonna center ourselves around zero, All right? So this is a very common thing We, you know, that I always, I like to joke that mathematicians only have two numbers they care about, zero and one. Well, zero is a nice number to work with. So we're gonna make this simple on ourselves. So we claim, that this function rn of x goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So the remainder goes to, goes to zero 
at every point in X. So what does this actually tell you? Well, it tells you that if you want to approximate E to the X, just use it to high enough polynomial. Because eventually, if you have a high enough term, you know, the remainder is going to be so small that you won't be able to tell the difference, no matter where you are next, right? So remember, I told you Taylor's theorem is a zoom-in theorem. And in our case, it, this would say zooming in to zero. But because we have that explicit formula from Taylor about what the error actually looks like, the remainder, we can go, we can say that we can super zoom out here and we can do this for the entire real line. So for example, I could approximate e to the 0 0.1 with a polynomial, or I could approximate e to the 100 million with a polynomial, or e to the negative Google, for example. All of that is going to work as long as I prove this plane. And so what this really says is something you might be familiar with if you've ever done infinite series, but essentially this says that e to the x can be written as this infinite series it looks like this of one over k factorial e uh, sorry x to the k and so again this is just using taylor's theorem your all of your derivatives of e to the x are just e to the x over and over and then so e to the zero that's e to the a and so that gives you the one in the uh, coefficient here and this is for all x Okay, so let's go ahead and prove this. So what's the proof of the claim? Well, here's what we'll do. So it suffices, so it suffices to show that for all X, uh, we have, well, Rn, of x, which is equal to, remember, just from Taylor's theorem that we just proved, this thing, n plus 1 factorial uh, x to the n plus 1. So it's a lot to write down, which this is e to the mu divided by n plus 1 factorial. And then x to the n plus 1 goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, right? That's what we want to show. We want to show that for any value of x, the remainder goes to zero and boom, we're done. Well, let's take a look at this for a second. So however, if I take some absolute values here, I can guarantee that the remainder is positive. And this thing, well, let's look at this. E to the mu is positive. N plus one factorial is positive. Really, the only thing I care about is keeping x positive because it'll just be easier to work with. And similarly, because e is an increasing function, if mu is between 0 and x, that means that this thing is no bigger than e to the absolute value of x over n plus 1 factorial times x to the n plus 1. Now, you're looking at that expression. You're thinking, that's really complicated. I don't know how I'm going to deal with x in here. I have great news. We don't care what X does, right? We care what N does. X is fixed. So we're doing this in a sort of pointwise way. We're picking a value of X and we're showing that the remainder goes to zero. We're not talking about uniform conversions here. It's just pointwise. So we want to show, so we now want to show, to show this, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And why? Because this is an upper bound. And so the squeeze theorem tells us that the remainder would go to zero as well. And this is just going to be easier for us to work with. So let's take a look at this. For x fixed, well, then there exists some capital N, some natural number capital N, such that well, if I take X and I divide it by a capital N, this is going to be smaller than a half, right? That is just the Archimedean principle. So we're going all the way back to the very first lesson from this class. But then if I look beyond that capital N and if I write, so I would like to write, uh, let's say little n is equal to capital N plus K. So K tells me just how much further past uh, and I am 
Uh, then we can have this. The absolute value of x to the n divided by n factorial. Well, this would be less than or equal to x to the capital N times x to the k. And then on the bottom here, I've got, uh, let's just keep it, well, let's write it as n plus k factorial. So I'm going beyond n factorial. Now, if I look at that denominator, I can say that this is equal to n factorial times n plus one times n plus two and so on and so forth all the way up to n plus k. But this thing is greater than n. This is greater than n. All of these are greater than n. And so what I can actually say is that this is less than or equal to x to the n divided by n factorial. Now capital N is fixed. We can do whatever we want with this piece. And then I've got x to the k divided by n to the k. So that is one term coming from this, one term from this, and so on and so forth. And there are k of them. So let's say k terms. So that's where the n to the k comes from. And I've got this inequality satisfying that. But then this becomes this piece right here that's fixed, one over two to the k, letting k go to infinity drags this thing down to zero. Now notice that letting k go to infinity, which is this, that thing is the same as letting little n go to infinity, right? So the only difference here is that I'm starting uh, k at zero, whereas I'm starting little n at capital N. But therefore, Rn of x goes to zero as n goes to infinity, which shows us that that Taylor remainder term goes to zero for any fixed value of x. So again, you want to figure out what the value of e to the 100 million is. Well, you can just calculate when your error is going to be small enough uh, using the Taylor theorem, right? So you can calculate exactly what that error will be. Uh, and then you just take n high enough to guarantee that the remainder is sufficiently small. So for example, if you want maybe three decimal places of accuracy, you take the remainder smaller than 10 to the minus three, and then you expand out your Taylor polynomial and put in x equal to 100 million or whatever the number is that you're interested in. Okay, so today we talked about one of the biggest, most important theorems in all of calculus. And I know that it sort of feels intangible talking about these Taylor polynomials sometimes and these approximations by polynomials. Uh, and it feels like maybe it's not as important as I'm making it sound. That would be incorrect. That would be a misconception, right? If you study uh, anything in analysis beyond this or anything in differential equations, partial differential equations, et cetera, numerical analysis, then Taylor polynomials are going to be your life. They come up all of the time. And the big reason is because they, they transform really complicated functions into ones that we can work with, polynomials, things that we love. And so in the next lecture that follows this, I'm going to do an application of Taylor's uh, theorem to uh, Newton's method, a root finding method. So how you can find, say, the square root of two, or at least an approximation of it numerically uh, in various other numbers that would arise as roots to polynomials. And we can work on this and we can quantify how accurate these things are using Taylor's theorem.